SPARC is a provincial network, and we would like to acknowledge the traditional Indigenous land on which we are so fortunate to create and partake in the arts. Our organization is situated in Ontario, which is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements, such as land purchases by the Crown, signed between 1781 and 1930, as well as many unceded and disputed territories. What we now call Ontario is home to many Indigenous nations, First Nations people, the Métis and Inuit people, who have been the traditional caretakers of this land and water for many generations, and who continue to live, work, and thrive here today. Personally, I'm located in southeastern Ontario, in an area covered by the Crawford Purchase of 1783, which is part of the larger agreements made during the late 18th and 19th centuries, known collectively as the Upper Canada Land Surrenders, a name that belies the violent and not always ethical way settlers treated the first peoples of this country when we first arrived. Hello and welcome to Spark Peer-to-Peer -peer Chats. I'm Rachel Marks, the Rezo Spark Network Executive Director. I am a middle-aged white woman with short pink hair. I'm wearing dark purple cat's eye glasses and uh, I like to call it an icy pink sweater. My pronouns are she and her. Today, I'm really excited to chat with Isabel Michaud, Issa. Issa Michaud is a Francophone visual artist and curator with an interest in local French history, installation, and ecologically minded art practices. She received her BFA from Algoma University. Isabel has exhibited and curated across Ontario with recent solo shows at Between Pheasants Contemporary and the Sioux Museum. She is the creator of Galerie Saint Cloud, a micro gallery with a virtual online presence for the promotion of art and artists in Northern Ontario. Issa also created one of the Sparks of Hope projects that we funded during the pandemic. I'm going to share that link uh, in the uh, with this post when I put it up. Welcome, Issa. It's great to have you here. We would love to hear and see a little bit about your work and then get into some questions. Well, merci uh, beaucoup. Bienvenue. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, I'm a middle-aged white woman wearing a blue crocheted shirt, a little necklace made of letters that spell Galerie Saint Clou and ceramic earrings with bees on them. And I have gray glasses and grayish hair with sh a short bob. Um, my pronouns are she and her. And I live in Sault Ste. Marie, Bawating, the tra traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation of the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850. So uh, when you were talking about performance, uh, I thought this was really interesting because uh, I don't consider myself a performance artist per se, but um, I would call myself uh, an artist who develops quiet performance or latent performance into my work, more and more anyway, and as we will see. I'm so happy today to share uh, some of my work. And uh, I've titled this presentation, If a Performance Happens in the Forest, Does It Make a Sound? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh. um, so I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Cap Rouge, Quebec, in the province of Quebec, just outside Quebec City. And um, as you can see, I was um, I loved uh, dressing up and uh, making fun of my parents uh, with a beer bottle, and um, I, I could be <laughs> trying to point my finger at people. <laughs> and um, I, I I became a quiet, uh, really effaced, uh, timid, shy teenager. And then I moved to Ontario, and uh, when I was in my 20s, I learned English, and I met my husband and started my life 
as a mother and a French professor uh, part-time at Algoma University. In 2018, I graduated with a BFA in visual arts at Algoma University, and my thesis work was called La Maison d'Etre, and it was about a dream, a recurring dream that I have of uh, finding a secret room in my house. And in that secret room, there have been for all, forever people living there, but they're gone and they've left everything behind. And I try to find who these people are. And this is what I was trying to portray in this work, in this construction work. You see a lot of architecture that's influenced by my father. I also put uh, blueprints. Uh, my father was a, a house builder and an architect, and I uh, inherited a lot of his blueprints and I put them in my work. Yeah. In 2019, I, I did um, a series of painting with my son, Jonathan, who has autism. He started uh, writing stories on typewriters, and I took inspiration from these stories to make uh, a series of 30 paintings that I showed at the Timber Village Museum um, uh, Gallery in Blind River. And at that time, uh, I had just graduated, and I was trying to find my way, and painting was my first and it still is a big love in my life, but I became very interested in all kinds of other uh, practices and arts, and I didn't want to stop myself from um, trying anything that I felt needed to be done for what I wanted to express, basically. In 2020, I had... Um, the greatest uh, honor to get an Ontario Arts Council grant to um, put together Des Coupures with uh, four other Francophone artists, which uh, we showed at the beginning of the pandemic inside the gallery with the windows. So it was like a show that you could see from the windows. Uh, these are some of my work. Snack. It's uh, découpure means cut out, mm -hmm. and uh, this delves into the feeling of being a cut and paste person that comes from an area and then has to kind of integrate themselves into a new area, and it you mm -hmm. get this feeling of mm -hmm. it's not quite what you what you understand what you're trying to say, but you're kind of trying to fit things the, the best way you can. Mm -hmm. um, I started thinking about performance because I had uh, friends and colleagues around me that were doing some and I wasn't really fully understanding it, but I wanted to try to open my mind and try to see what else is possible. Uh, in a small community, you don't get many opportunities to view different artworks or be exposed to different types of, of work. I would travel often to Toronto or Montreal and try to see uh, galleries and see things, but within really short amounts of time of one or two days. So it was never enough to complete uh, things. But um, so... During the pandemic, uh, we did a, a, a small performance with Michel Loubert. We filmed it and we showed it um, in this room and we did a Facebook Live pro projecting the performance on the wall and we were trying to interact like that, like try to find a public, a different public. And this was my first time doing that. And uh, Michel did uh, a wonderful job. We had uh, Mireille Gagnon-Mos on the right here with Michel Loubert. I, I really, really enjoyed doing this uh, sort of, I call it Franco-Ontarian Gothic. It was just like a placement with all kinds of hats and shovels and 
So I'm trying my hand at different ways of making art and saying different things. In 2020, I also had the great fortune of going to um, take a class with Alicia Hunt through NASCAD. It was called Exploring Place Through Textile. And the idea was that you would walk and you would access one of your senses through the walk and you would document it in, in a field note. And I started doing that and taking note of plant life around me. And I started no noticing the bees. I would notice the history of a place, uh, the socioeconomic of the areas where I was walking. And it really influenced me. It was at that point that my work started taking different directions. Um, and walking is an art practice. If, if you can find these books, there's a free PDF on, on the internet of Wanderlust by Rebecca Solnit. I would really recommend this book to uh, feel w what is walking in your practice. Um, Mary Oliver, Upstream, Richard Long, A Lion Made by Walking. And Laurent Vaillancourt is in Hearst, uh, Saint-Born. So, <laughs> um, in that course, I started experimenting a little bit more with textiles. And I was thinking about my t love of dressing up when I was a child. And I started making hats and bonnets. Um, but... And uh, inspired by flowers, okay. but but I stayed really like it was it was inside my house and never came out. And you can see that I have like a little shy smile, like I felt I felt weird doing that. <laughs> it it was, um, but I loved it at the same time. It was so much fun, and every time I see these images, I I just crack. Mm -hmm. I did uh, some uh, seed bombs um, and I threw them on mm -hmm. the ground. Mm -hmm. Then um, I started making forms. So the forms, the sculptures would do the performance for me. I, I wouldn't be the one doing it. So I, I was thinking more in that sense over there. Um, and that wrap around in front of the water, um, it made me think of listening. And I started thinking about listening more. And that kind of started uh, also a, a lot of work. Um, this work is at the Pinchman's uh, Cafe in Sudbury right now. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to evoke a sense of listening uh, of healing, plants, uh, nature, uh, and make sort of performative work. Um, wonder what's going on, you know, uh, it would it would be a mystery. Um, and in my mind, I was an apothecary mm -hmm. working or a healer working with my various ingredients to make potions and heal nature and heal myself at the same time. So this idea continued in my mind with J'écoute listening, and I started doing a non-permanent backpack, art backpack, which was called Les Rubans Voyageurs, and then I called it Traces later when I did the video for you, which I was so blown away because at first I didn't even believe that it was true. <laughs> it's like, is this a real thing? <laughs> it is. <laughs> I was so proud. I was so honored. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it it gave gave us a boost um and it's still a work that i really love mm -hmm. it's uh, i'm 
it was hard to do uh, because I'm shy uh, walking around with my artwork on my back. But these weren't so bad. These moments weren't so bad. I felt connected. I would connect a, a piece of um, weaving, a ribbon that I've made, and I would connect it to a tree. And then I would spend some time listening. And, and that was wonderful. Then I'd come home, I'd send off the painting and then start another one. And I did that 40 times. Wow. This um, artist is Frank Bello. He's, he makes uh, Baga Adoe sticks, which is lacrosse sticks. And he, we often have conversations. I visit him and he gave me not he, he didn't give me the direct inspiration but talking with him i started thinking about his work and how he works with natural elements to live his culture and that's what i was trying to do myself as well in in this um maybe abstracted way i, I don't know um the time that I felt the most vulnerable and weird uh, during my performance was on the left, the image on the left with the board with the copper on it because it was really abstract and I was walking on Queen Street, which gets a lot of traffic. And I felt like really, really weird. Yeah. Um, and vulnerable but I I said to Dave I gotta do this I gotta do it he took a few photos of me on that walk and that was one I just went down the, in an area close to the street where there are some trees I wanted to uh, document this so then that takes us to Galerie saint Cru, which is a space that I developed in my workshop so that I would have uh, an opportunity to converse with other artists and not be always stuck in, in my workshop and not meeting people, not talking too much, you know. So I wanted to, I wrote a grant, I got a grant for it, and I was able to present seven uh main artists and two more uh so nine and then in total 11 artists so this was uh, annie king's headspace uh, and just to show you it's not a very big space at all it's just a wall in, in my studio but i thought that my idea was it doesn't matter you can create magic <laughs> It's like Mary Poppins. Yes. <laughs> so um, this uh, exhibition was uh, by Zenith Liddy, Giwe Widun, and uh, Janik Guy from Sudbury visited that day. And she was doing uh, hand gestures. I thought that was beautiful mm. with the um, projection of Zenith's work. Uh, Kitty Huxon's Aware Feeling That Moves was also very beautiful. A lot of people would come and change the photos onto the overhead projector and it would change a little bit the images that, that were shown on the wall. It changed the, the space quite beautifully. Mm -hmm. And we did every time I did uh, an exhibition, I had uh, a performance with, I mean, not a performance. I, I felt it was a performance. It was an <laughs> art talk, mm -hmm. but like what I think what I'm trying to say is that visual artists do a lot of performance in, in their work. They yes. are, they have to present their work. They have to talk in front of people to talk about their work. They have to do art talks. Uh, there's a lot of public aspects uh, of the work, mm -hmm. which I always find a little bit difficult, but I get through it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
another uh, work that I did um, that I w I really wanted to express what it, what it felt like for me to live in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, be a fr francophone artist. Um, and I did poetry for this. Uh, it's like a three minute film um, that got projected at in Sudbury at La Giano and um, also in Toronto at a festival Cine Franco. Um, but it's a really, you know, simple, uh, humble little video with my phone. But I was testing green screen and trying to do different things. I really wanted to push and start to innovate with my work. And uh, I could mix French with it and express ideas of nature, which I love. And um, so for the, for the purpose of brevity, I'm not going to show that video. Um, I noticed that you posted this uh, exhibition with mm -hmm. uh, my photo on Facebook, and I'm so happy that you chose this one uh, because it's it's a, a beta version of what I'm working on now. And I did this for Ontario Culture Days, uh, only two, two evenings, but it's in the recycling bay in my building. And I stood beside it uh, and some people came to see it. And I thought that this was the most sort of performative or, you know, the most blurred line yeah. uh, between. Yeah. So um, maybe we can talk about it yeah. uh, later. Um, but uh, this work is now uh, being developed uh, in in a bigger format and with films that I'm rotoscoping and it's going to be a performance with three projectors uh, and yeah, so a sculpture and also I got this uh, program called Resolu Marina where I can do VJing live oh, cool. with videos. So I learned it uh, in Toronto very quickly for two hours and now I'm I'm trying to pick up the pieces and figure it out. Yes. It's coming along. I I, I want to present it for Ontario Culture Days again uh, in September or October. And this time it will be in my space. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps outside we'll see if I can find a good spot. And this metal structure was inspired by Michelle Pearson Clark's Quantum Choir, mm. uh, which is an amazing uh, installation that I saw in 2022 at the Art Gallery of Hamilton, the Hamilton Art Gallery. <laughs> I don't know which one, but uh, it's, it's coming along. Uh, in building this work, I, I try to include uh, friends, artists, other um, emerging artists, so that it I'm learning from them as well, and I I can stay young and fresh <laughs> in a way um, with new ideas, and um, like I don't want to limit myself, so I'm always trying to reach out and make more friends, and <laughs> you know, bring them in. <laughs> so. Uh, I started learning rotoscope animation. I put that in the work as well. And a lot about biocomposite um, and bioplastics right now. I'm trying to make everything. So my work, if, if, if it's left by itself, it can biodegrade and not leave any waste. That's what I want to do. I'm trying mm -hmm. to aim for that for as much ecological as I can or biodegradable as I can. You can't always, but you can try. You can give it your best shot. And mm -hmm. I find that uh, it leads to innovation then. So then I thought about the subject of this talk and um, performance and collaboration and the 
crossover uh, and I remembered that I did a collaboration with a slam artist over the summer where he sent me his poetry and I made drawings, paintings, watercolors, and a little projection. And then on one day, July 14th, we got together and I showed him my work and he showed me his work because I had sent him some images of my artwork. So we both influenced each other and inspired each other to create new work. And we presented it to each other on that one day. So that was kind of fun and wonderful to and motivating to to work this way. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fringe North in uh, Sault Ste. Marie is uh, really developing the multi-arts aspect. Um, I, I did uh, a projection and there were paintings added to all of the other exhibitions and performances during that time. Aluma Trad uh, last summer asked me to do an activity with uh, the folks uh, over there. They do music, traditional music, uh, and there's a francophone co component to it. I took photos of the musicians and I made cutouts, wood cut cutouts, and I had people paint them. And then I assembled it and gave it to Algomatrad as a present of uh, that day as a reminder of the joy and um, the wonderful time we had together that mm -hmm. day. A huge performance that happened during Fringe as well, Annie King and Michael Birch filled a whole uh, warehouse uh, at Hylien. It's a, a company that makes solar panels and while their warehouse was empty they allowed for this huge exhibition to happen and annie king did uh, a, a walking performance holding a big rock a big black piece of charcoal it looked like and michael birch played music on his drums and you could hear poetry being read too during this event that was one of the biggest shows I've seen in Sault Ste. Marie. Wow. Um, I was also very fortunate to see this performance uh, at the Galerie du Nouvel Ontario in Sud Sudbury by Jorge Cueto, Journalism, where he took um, his work as a journalist into a performance uh, and interviewed folks about Sudbury, took photos of them, and then projected the photos outside the walls of the Galerie du Nouvel Ontario, and uh, recorded the voices and did more sound work. I believe he had photographs at the end. At, at first, he only had one on the wall, and then he added them as he went. I thought that was an amazing mm -hmm. performance. Something that's really amazing is the vitality of the drag world yes. and the indigenous shows that are popping up. And Ojawa Kwe uh, is uh, a wonderful, wonderful drag artist. Uh, but but Betuwana is another one of their names. Um, and they organize this these wonderful events often they're the machine behind but there are many people the house of gore is has many people uh with it as well i i don't know all of the people but anyway it's uh it's really taking performance in a refreshing direction in sous saint marie mm. uh andrian deschaine is a pianist that uh uh, commandeered 
so so many talents um and i know that uh, my professor andrea pinero who is a wonderful visual artist worked really closely with andrian at the lighting and the look of the video that she did of her performance um and in relations to this new album that uh, Andriana has just put together, which is uh, about beautiful Brazilian music, jazz. Mm -hmm. The Ice Follies is a wonderful event every two years, and there are so many amazing performances during that festival. Um, and Anmitagzi does performance and installation. They really bridge the the two. It's seamless for many people, uh, such as um, Annie and Michael. It's seamless for them. Mm. I would say that I tend to do more uh, latent performance or quiet performance than, yeah. yeah. So this is, this is it. Wow. I think, I think. Oh, yes, <laughs> I wanted to leave you with a very important message that um, everything that we do is for love and with mm -hmm. love. And that's the ma magic ingredient for us. And you can see Miranda Bouchard on the left and I'm on the right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's it. Oh, Issa, thank you so much. I, I, There's so many things going through my head from your presentation. Uh, first off, I have to say that I truly believe love is the revolution. So I, I'm so thankful that you finished with love. Um, I have to say, when you sent in your proposal for the spark of hope, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm a playwright. I create immersive theater for disabled children and seniors, um, but I don't consider myself, like I can't make things. I can't make anything pretty or, or not pretty or it's not provocative. Um, and when I saw your first video and you had walked around with this beautiful canvas for the day and then you went back to your studio and you scraped it and you started fresh, it blew my mind. I was like, wow. This piece was was shown for 24 hours, not even. And then you just started again. I, I can't wrap my brain around that because in theater, even though live performance, theater, dance, <clears throat> music, the beauty is in it being unique every night and changing every day. I never viewed the creation of visual art in that way what what led you to that decision of doing that oh thank you thank you so much for asking this question i appreciate it so much um from from what i can remember i believe i was trying to seek a detachment from the precious, uh, from the object of a painting, of the commercial aspect of uh, a work, and really bring myself into a letting go mm -hmm. and be in the moment. Um, and I wanted to also express something. Oh, and I remember, okay, now, um, I had wanted to make sculptures in a park and I had tried to contact the uh, conservation um, authorities and the municipality to ask permission and I couldn't get permission so I had to do something, and um, I also uh, was thinking about Frank Bellow and, and his work, using what's around him to express himself, and um, I felt that 
I wanted to have something that would be sustainable and self that would go in a loop in a way that I would I would give it its time, but then I would let go of it. And I did feel there are some times when I felt sad mm -hmm. that I was doing that in a way it felt a little bit self-harming in a strange way. I was like, am I doing something horrible here? No, it's okay. You're giving room for the next drawing, the next painting. It has, there are some things like that I put my, myself through almost, I don't know if it's like <laughs> some kind of religious thing. <laughs> or some kind of remnant of wanting to Ooh. i i don't know i don't know where where um, that is like some sort of denial mm -hmm. of something but really when i look at all the the documents that i've taken of it i'm so happy i did it mm -hmm. it's so like it touches my heart every time I see it. Yeah, it, yeah. it was it was beautiful. And and everyone out there who's watching this, I'm gonna make sure that the link to that video um is in the comment box underneath so that you can watch it as well because it it, it changed things for me. I, I, I viewed the creation of visual art in a very different way after that. Um yeah, thank you for, for answering that. I really appreciate it. And I want to say there is so much cool stuff happening in Sault Ste. Marie. Oh my gosh, <laughs> really cutting edge sort of work and collaboration. Like the thing that really gets me is this collaboration. Like I'm, I'm really um, thankful that you shared about the slam poet and yourself. Like that, that very fascinating. I think that that tied with your question about um yeah uh artists that want to discover their culture mm -hmm. how how can a performance help artists to discover their their culture and um that would be an example for me of a good way to collaborate in a way that is not cultural to tourism yeah. so that you're uh, giving each other something and it's not over a long period it was like maybe a month before we had talked and we had shared our stuff then a month later we were going to meet and do our things so we gave ourselves uh, enough time to do a few things and not not be too worried about it and not to second guess or whatever but I feel that this would would bring uh, really interesting conversations. Yeah, definitely. And I think too, um, it, it really leads me to um, the question of, do you think that this moving between fields or genres or this collaboration is the way to keep arts alive in our communities? So about that, um, I went back to the idea of, does it make sense? Yeah. So I don't know if you do that, but every year I do a sort of retreat <laughs> where if I can, and if I have the money, <laughs> uh, where I write down three things. Um, what are some of the things that, what are some of the dreams? What are my dreams? What do I want to accomplish? That's one thing. What do I want to learn? That's the next thing. And then service to mm -hmm. who, with who, and for who. So those are the three things that I look at and I, I write them down. And sometimes I have one that I work really hard on, you know? Yeah. And, um, so I would say that if, if let's say you're um, thinking about theater and uh, you want to include, let's say something funny like roller skating. Yes. <laughs> 
then does it make sense um and how are you going to go about it um i think if it's authentic and that you share visions and you communicate well i think it can lead to wonderful things and for that i have a perfect example i don't know if you've seen it on crave there's a show called i have nothing by uh with carolyn taylor she's uh, a comedian who wants to choreograph Ekaterina Gordova and David Peltier. Yes. Wow. So I won't tell you much about it because <laughs> I won't spoil it for you. You just have to watch it and see the process of creation. You see it. Mm -hmm. And it's something so out there. And it creates beauty and meaning and that's what i believe in that mm -hmm. if you have a vision and it makes sense to you then go ahead but it doesn't make sense to me for let's say an artist who's been 30 years a photographer who wants to all of a sudden learn drawing and not not take years to do it mm -hmm. you know okay you yeah everybody can pick up anything and dabble in it you know there's no rule that says you can't but there are some things that i, I believe have to be respected up to a point you know yeah. so if it makes sense and if it's your dream and your vision go for it full heartedly and um don't let don't uh fart around too much you know like it has to be serious because everybody you know has their their own like you were talking about um uh, immovable boundaries mm -hmm. like sometimes there are some things that are need need to be respected and you cannot just fly through them and just say okay it's, it's good enough or whatever you know yeah yeah um it's uh I think <clears throat> oh I'm trying to find that where did I yes yeah, so I was saying um we we all know that in rural and remote areas we as artists or art creators and workers we tend to cross over these boundaries um that are often seen as immovable or concrete um and and I think that I like what you said like it needs to make sense um, and but there are some things that still need to be respected. Um, I had a, a friend visual artist come in and paint sets for me paint flats and and really they're all four by eight canvases and she was like, "Ooh, this is like the biggest canvas I've ever painted. Um, but it was interesting because we each had, she had the knowledge of painting and creating, but I had the knowledge of stagecraft and, and how to build it. And it was, we respected that with each other, but the lines were blurred. Can you maybe share a few other times where you blurred the lines? Hmm. Um, I think that's what I'm doing with ex um where I'm taking big, I'm making big leaps here into film, video, and digital media, sound. Uh, I've started making my own little arrangements. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the biggest example I can think of right now it, it was difficult to uh, get that first grant I, I applied to it I and I didn't get it and then I I added a video of me going to uh, Le Labo in Toronto and do a residency there and I explained my vision in that in that video and that's how people could see that, oh, now I get it, what she's trying to do. It's it's not easy when you have a concept and 
you know, you're trying to learn new tools too. It's technology is difficult. Um, but I did get this rotoscoping thing going and I think that I'll, it will, it will be, I've seen a little bit, um, mm -hmm. I was going to show, but it's, it's maybe too long. Um, I think I'll wait until October <laughs> to show the final one. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's the, the idea that I could think of. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's great. Um, I wanted to ask, so from someone who's maybe come strictly from a performing background, what might you say to them to sort of get them to see that, that, or what are the benefits of involving a visual artist in performing arts? Oh, you have a visitor. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to let them in. Okay. So what are the benefits? I think that I grew up in a world where music, theater, uh, art were part of almost my everyday. Quebec is very arts centered. And to me, anybody can do stuff, you know? <laughs> You can play the spoons, you can sing, you can learn the guitar. At school, at school, they were teaching it. Yeah. So everybody knew how to play the guitar or the harmonica or, you know, uh, it wasn't a big deal. Um, so I think perhaps visual artists can bring uh, the ideas of the art history behind other artists, other movements, and add ideas to your um, costumes, to your sets, to your sound arrangements. They can provide maybe some context, uh, some graphic ideas, some lighting, um, you know, all kinds of things, props, mm -hmm. tons, yeah. Yeah. I was recently having a conversation with a friend of Sparks, Kate Proctor, <clears throat> and she was telling me about this uh, project in the States where an artist was brought in on a municipal level and there was a abandoned home and they reimagined this house where, and I know I'm not getting this exactly right, but I will find the link and also put it with this chat where the house um, was rebuilt as part of the community and it folded out mm. and so it folded out into a gallery a performance space a community gathering space all because this visual artist had had this idea of taking something that was broken or not working in their community abandoned really and they reimagined it to become this central focal point of the community and a gathering place for people. And it, again, once again, it just like my mind went, what? This is the most amazing thing ever. Um, and really made me think like, wow, you know, and, and she made the point, like, what if we had artists in different, in unusual places, right? What if we had people that saw the world differently working in in different milieu different mediums right um and i think that some of the slides that you've shown us are, are definitely that like looking at things in a different way and combining art forms um perhaps in new and exciting ways um so you're working on the piece for culture days and that's in October. Um, so we're going to hopefully wait. And you know, <laughs> maybe some of us can come up to the Sioux <laughs> and see oh, that. I um, would love that. 
Yeah, I, I would love it. I think it's like a spark school trip. And I think everyone out there agrees with me that we should come up to the Sioux and see that. That would be beautiful. Um, can you, you've shared a little about Gallery Saint Cloud. Can you, can you just talk just a little bit more about, about your ultimate goals and, and ambitions with it? Oh, uh, Galerie Saint Cloud was um, a, a way for me to push myself out, outside of my comfort zone and um, really try to give a voice to underrepresented voices in my region. And there are not that many places where you can exhibit. There are, but they don't necessarily always like innovation or it's it's uh it's difficult mm -hmm. uh, but we're carving out spaces the museum is becoming a place where new ideas can happen and flourish with the french festival there's the art hub who is starting to become a little bit more um uh, you know, available for, for folks who want to do different things and there's no judgment there. So uh, people can at least enter in um, a place, a safe space. And there's the Art Gallery of Algoma who does very traditional big shows, um, uh, not much uh, innovation happening there. So Galerie saint Clou was for me a way to to open that door a little bit and um, I will continue doing that for now I've put a little bit of a mute on um, on things because I'm building my installation and also I had applied for a grant that I didn't get broken <laughs> <laughs> and I was hoping I could I could have four more uh presentations um, of artists I have met in the community and um, I was looking forward to that but uh, I'm gonna have to go back to the drawing board and try to find another way to fund this work because it's important to pay artists fees um, yes. I'm not a commercial gallery so I pay artist fees and um, I do an art talk and I, I build a web on my website, I, I build a page for each of the artists so they can always refer back to it in their applications, in their grant applications. The professionalization of my community is very difficult. And I feel that a solo exhibition gives artists that possibility to, um, to, uh, hone their skills hone their craft and keep keep building more and more professional work it's really important to exhibit your work mm -hmm. and it's very difficult here mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm hoping to continue uh, doing um, that's great about, um, I yeah. know something else popped into my head and I've just been listening to you talk and it's gone because I just so fascinated by your work and um I think maybe I'll end my questions here and just say like thank you so much for sharing with us um and and being a part of Spark uh, and saying like hey I do performance I'm a visual artist but it's a performance um we uh we really are working towards making sure that all arts are represented in Spark and and that all artists and art lovers and community animators feel welcome in Spark. So thank you for being here and being a member. Um, really thank you. That. Merci. C'est moi qui vous remercie. Mm -hmm. Lâchez pas. Don't don't let go. Lâchez pas la patate. Don't let go of the potato. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ever. <laughs> Um, so for everyone out there, we're sorry that we couldn't be live tonight with our technical difficulties, um, but we'll be posting this shortly, rural internet and 
a weird winter storm happening outside of my house. Um, but please join us here next month when our Northern coordinator, our Northern outreach coordinator, Jason Manitwabi is going to take the lead and he's going to host a chat on powwow etiquette. And that'll be on March 27th. And I think as a settler, one of my first experiences in Canada was a powwow um, as an immigrant. And, um, I'm sometimes not sure what to do or or how to behave or when do I get involved? Can I get involved? I don't know. And so Jason's going to take us through all of that, um, which I think is very important. And um, and he'll have some special guests with him, and that'll be on the 27th of March. Um, so please join us. Isa Misho, thank you so much. I'm going to stop our recording now and say good night to all of our folks out there. And uh, we will see you in March. Thank you. Bonsoir.